Okay, it's uh, 2 o'clock now. I know people are still coming in, but this part, the introduction part is not important anyway, so I'll get over it, so don't even bother listening. Um, my name is Steve Rosted. Red Hat uh, pays me to play with Linux. Uh, my hobbies include working with the real-time kernel, uh, this tracing utility called ftrace, uh, testing utility called ktest, uh, the make local mod config, things like that. That's what I kind of play on. Um, not really much else to say about me. Uh, let's say, back in 2007, I gave the talk uh, to introduce the real-time patch. It was called Inside the RT Patch. Uh, I gave it at uh, the Ottawa Linux Symposium, OLS, um, obviously in Ottawa. And it was extremely popular there. No one knew exactly what this RT patch was. They kept hearing about it. They heard uh, Linus Travals just call us crazy people. Um, so people are very, very interested. And then last year, um, I came and gave a talk about uh, K-Test, and people were asking me, why aren't you talking about the real-time patch? Uh, it's been a long time since you presented it. And I said, OK, you're probably right. I probably should reintroduce what the real-time patch is about. It's becoming more popular. A lot of it is now in mainline. Um, so it's not, I, yeah, we do have a real-time patch, but it's really focusing going on mainline. It's not, it's not about if it's going to go in mainline, it's when it's going to go in mainline. That's the true question of today. This is the slide, the actual slide that I started with um, back, in, um, back in 2007, or less. Uh, so they asked me to change it, so I updated it. Um, so this is my updated version of the slides. And, but things have changed within back then. Uh, for example, uh, well, I should call it understanding preempt RT, because now it's, um, it's no longer, like I said, the real-time patch. It's, the preempt RT is the config option that you enable. And since we expect it to go in mainline, I don't want to talk about an RT patch. I want to talk about preempt RT. But like I said, things have changed. For example, Darren works up for Intel now. He doesn't work for IBM. See, it was IBM, now it's Intel. <laughs> but that doesn't really matter because uh, he's not part of this presentation anyway. So I gave this exact same talk in Barcelona a few months ago at the Barcelona e, uh, the ELC EU. And, um, hello. And Free Electrons posted it. Uh, and actually, it's kind of funny because that's Darren Hart right there. Uh, and they, uh, I love Free Electrons. They posted this. And they said, hey, they, they, not only did they post this a video of it, of my whole talk is on video. You go online, see this whole talk there. And on the blog, uh, they even said, hey, we recommend seeing Steve Rosted's -time, real-time patch. I'm like, wait, wait, I'm recycling this talk now. <laughs> like, uh, people are coming to see me now. Like, really? You're going to be giving me uh, or showing this? You don't need to come here. Just watch the video. So what should I talk about? <laughs> <laughs> now, I visited, in, we had the real-time conference in uh, Raleigh, it was like right outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, where my brother, my brother lives with his, and my sister-in-law, and they're into um, pumpkin chucking. So, you know, maybe we could talk about pumpkin chucking, but we want to be more real-time stuff. So what really interests me is really, you know, trebuchets. <laughs> so actually, I was like, wow, maybe it'd be cool to make a real-time trebuchet. So, you know, things, how do you design it? There's level different way it designs. Well, maybe I can make a simulator that simulates it. And so I started working on a simulator. I thought like, this would be cool to add like a real time simulator. And so I developed this thing. Whoops. And I said, let's try to simulate it. One well, thing I learned was after I started it, <laughs> That's a wacky premature. <laughs> I'm going. I, I, this is like my new obsession. I'm going to make this thing actually work. So uh, let me kill that. Whoops. No, not just friction. There's a lot of things. The problem. There's a lot of things. <laughs> a trebuchet happens to be a double pendulum. Algorithm, a simple pendulum is very easy. When you attach another pendulum on top of a pendulum, that's called a double pendulum, and it causes a lot of calculus. So I decided to give up on this <laughs> and talk right back about real time. <laughs> so where do you get the real time patch? 
Right now, uh, I have a stable repository. I'm the maintainer of the stable tree. Uh, I right now maintain a 3.0 RT patch, which will be, um, I'm going to stop maintaining it as soon as Greg Crow Hartman stops maintaining the 3.0 mainline, which is this year. I can't wait for that to happen. Uh, it's becoming more of a, a burden on me because there's a lot of things that are broken about the 3.0 that I just won't fix. That's fixed in 3.2, 3.4. I have a 3.2 RT patch and a 3.4 RT patch. Thomas Kleichner is still working on the 3.6 RT patch. I believe he's going to uh, come out with a 3.8, but he, ha he says, I'll do it if I do it. Uh, so there's no guarantee that it will come out at 3.8. Uh, but when he does, I will be the 3.6 maintainer, but there's no 3.6 RT patch or mainline. So I might still maintain it just, well, just for temporarily. Uh, right now, 3.4, I believe, is the long-term patch. Uh, if three, I don't know, 3.8 is not going to be long-term. Anyone know, what's the next long-term? 3.10, I think, is going to be that Greg's going to do. So we do a 310. So basically the idea is I will maintain a real-time stable branch as long as there's a mainline version of that same branch or that tree is being maintained. Patches are there. The wiki page is there. Uh, you could get this slides up like when I'm done with it. Since I just finished writing or finishing tweaking this about 10 minutes ago, um, I will upload this, these slides right after this talk. So what is a real-time operating system? Now, the thing is, I hate the term real-time because you have, it's so overused, it's abused. Uh, real-time can mean anything. It means right now, okay? That's what real-time is. Um, I really wish they called it, you know, a deterministic operating system, you know, DOS. Uh, <laughs> it's exactly, actually, DOS was actually probably the best real-time system ever. So what does a deterministic operating system do? Well, basically, it does what you expect it to do when you expect it to do it. That's really what it's all about. It's about you know, no surprises, no anomalies. That's what a real-time system's about. It's not about you know, real-time, because people think real-time's fast. You know, I was at one customer site, and they said, I can't wait to see your, you know, get your real-time kernel up to see the performance it's going to give. I was like, you know, uh, real-time means determinism. Determinism kind of adds overhead, which is kind of the opposite of you know, what real fast is about. So yes, we try work very hard. We do lots of tricks to get throughput out. We do a lot of things to make this as fast. Our goal is to be just as fast on the average case as mainline. That won't be. But we're probably, we, uh, we are, we are worst case faster than mainline. Mainline has anomalies. Mainline, you'll see something that could, you know, you could run this command in like 25 microseconds and most of the time. And when you run it on RT, it's 35 microseconds. But every so often, it may take two milliseconds to run that same command on mainline. For us, maybe 40 milliseconds. Huge difference. That's what it's about. Worst case, fast times. That's what real time gives you. Um, you want to be able to make, make your deadlines. You want to set up your system, understand your system, and that requires homework. Uh, real time OS is only as good as what the hardware it's running on. Some people forget this. Uh, if your hardware has you know, cache issues, SMI is going off, you're going to have issues with your real-time response. I mean, if the system hardware stops because of, uh, the bus is now all congested and you're, you have to wait for things to happen, the real software is not going to help you there. And people forget that. They sometimes blame us all the time. We say, well, let's look at our hardware. That's why the, um, we like to, at Red Hat, we have a um, certification of hardware that we actually look at the hardware. We run a bunch of tests on it to make sure the hardware can actually do somewhat what we want. And we'll actually rate, we'll give it, say, well, Expect maybe like, you know, 100 or 150 millisecond latencies, um, millis microsecond latencies, not millisecond, microsecond latencies. Well, of course, 100, 100 uh, millisecond latencies may be acceptable to some, or one millisecond latency may be acceptable for some. It's not acceptable for what we would do, but it's there. And believe it or not, the, the mainline kernel is not, will not guarantee one millisecond latencies. I could, there's several times where I could trigger three to four millisecond latencies with the real-time kernel, even, or sorry, with the mainline kernel, even with a lot of... Um, the stuff that came from real time in there already. It doesn't have everything yet. So what is the goal of the real time kernel? Basically, we want to be a 100% preemptible kernel. So what does that mean? That means that we could react to anything at any time. An interrupt comes in, uh, you know, it triggers, like you get a response from the network. Um, some device, some sensor sends an uh, interrupt to the CPU. We want that CPU to be able to stop what it's doing and respond to it if it's required to do so. So we need to be able to stop at any time. We can't be processing you know, MP4 
three play, play, someone playing their MP3 player or something when you know an interrupt comes in. We want to be able to stop going and work, uh, process anything that may be more important. So that's what we want. But obviously, you can't have a 100% preemptible kernel. But as Lita says, we're crazy. We will try. Uh, we haven't succeeded yet, but no one has. So that kind of makes us feel a little better. Um, so how do we do this? Well, one thing is we try to disable or do not disable. We try to disable disabling interrupts. Does that make sense? <laughs> we try not to disable interrupts as much as possible. Um, and we also try to make sure that any type of, thing, any type of instance where preemption is disabled, preemption means you can't stop to you know, switch out this task and work on another task, we try to get rid of that throughout the kernel. Um, we want quick, quick reaction times. So when you install the real-time patch, and hopefully when it's a mainline, you'll get a menu that looks like this. Uh, in your you know, make menu config, you'll see there's the full real-time preamp kernel. And let me explain some of these just to review. I don't know if people do defaults, but I'll go over, for those that you know, just never thought about it, what do all these things mean in the preemption, mo preemption models? No preemption, that's the top one. This is basically was the idea was for servers that don't need to do, like not for servers that act for uh, web servers, but basically servers that are doing tasks, batch, batch processing of tasks. Things that you don't care about a reaction, you just want stuff done. Just send the stuff out, get the job done, you're compile, maybe compiling, something that does just a lot of hard work, but you really don't care you know, the reaction for it, you just want throughput. Uh, servers like don't disable preemption because whenever you disable preemption, uh, there's overhead to do a little switch. Or sorry, don't disable preemption. Whenever you do a uh, context switch, there's a little overhead there. So sometimes just serializing everything is faster. That's usually some of the best throughput you get is by serializing all your tasks. Let it run to completion. Do the next one. Run to completion. Do the next one. Server model like that is what we do. No one actually enables this anymore that I know of. Um, voluntary preemption. This is what a lot of the uh, distributions actually default to because they're still a little bit nervous about preemptible kernel, which is in mainline. It's been in mainline for a long time. Uh, voluntary preemption is you'll see a lot of places that say might sleep. Might sleep is like a debugging situation where um, if you have a preemptible kernel, you don't, there's some places you don't want to schedule. So if you call something, say if you disable interrupts, and then you schedule, call the scheduler utility, you could break things because what happens is, um, if you disable interrupts and you schedule out, you kind of have to state in a kind of a weird state because you're not supposed to schedule out while interrupts are disabled. Actually, worse yet, if you grab a spin lock and then you just schedule out. That's even worse because you go away and then someone that comes in goes to grab a spin lock, he's going to spin and, and you could block or he could block you from coming back and releasing it, deadlock. So we put might sleeps in places where if you, if you set a debug option and it hits this might sleep, it'll actually give you a warning and say, hey, you know, you are in a situation where you shouldn't be sleep scheduling, but this, what you just called, could schedule. Because that's the thing about debug, or that's the thing about um, kernel development. You might be calling this function hundreds of times with interrupts disabled or spin locks held, but if it never schedules out, you don't care. Like, it won't worry about it. So this lets you know, like, this, you know, this might block on something. It might grab a mutex and block, and you're basically screwed. Um, so what does voluntary preemption have to do? What does it have to do about voluntary preemption? What's really nice about all these might sleeps, it's saying that this function can schedule. We are specifically saying we could schedule at this point. So what voluntary preemption means is when it gets to, hits one of those might sleeps, it will call a might resched, which calls condition resched, which will say, hey, if you know, something came in and wants us to wake up, let's schedule at this point. We already know it's safe because we'll warn about it. So voluntary preemption is just all these might sleeps turn into preemption points within the kernel. So that's how that works. Uh, the preemptible kernel uh, was created by Robert Love. His idea of preemptible kernel, the way he came out about it, is, uh, it was based off of basically SMP, the uh, multiprocessors. Because multiprocessors is the way you think is the spin locks. So if you have some critical section that cannot be touched, well, it can't be reentrant. And it's great on a uniprocessor system with no preemption, you just work with whatever data you have. There is no critical section. Everything is protected. Uh, but if you have a critical section where if you know, two processes were trying to access the data or modify the data at the same time, you're going to corrupt the data. So you protect it with the little spin locks. Everyone should understand what spin locks are. What Robert Love realized was this actually, this model also works, say if we had a preemptible model, where you actually could preempt the kernel. Uh, 
these spin locks could actually represent places that we can't preempt. So what the preemptable kernel does, even on a uniprocessor system, a spin lock now becomes functional, and it says just disable preemption while I grab the spin lock. So all spin locks you grab just disables preemption, and when you release the spin lock, preemption is enabled again. Anything outside that spin lock can be preempted. There are some cases where that's not always the case, and that's why there's a preempt disable function that you'll see throughout the kernel, preempt disable, preempt enable, because we say, well, we're doing something special here. We're not grabbing any spin locks, but we can't, if we schedule out here, we could break things. Um, on, uni, on a uniprocessor system or a, well, no, not uniprocessor system, but when preempt is turned off, uh, these preempt disables are no ops. The preempt kernel basic, uh, basic RT. Now, this is where the RT patch now. This is not in mainline. Not yet. Well, actually, this may never be in mainline. I'm just popping this up just because you'll see it. If you download, install the real-time kernel, you'll see this config option. I'm going to explain this. Basically, Thomas Gleichner likes to debug the real-time kernel, and since there's a lot of things that the real-time patch still does, um, there's a bunch of things it adds, and then it also adds uh, spin locks turning into mutexes, which I'll talk about. And the thing about this is he wants to make sure that if something breaks, he knows what broke. Um, was it the uh, mutexes or was something else that he added? So what he did is he added this config option just so that he doesn't need to... Uh, if something breaks and doesn't break under this config option, he knows kind of like, okay, it's the mutexes. So this is sort of debug, um, a debug uh, what's called option. Basically ignore it. Wasted too much time on that already. Um, now this is the thing that everyone is here for. Well, when you select the fully preemptable kernel, this is the real-time patch. This enables everything that you want. It gives you um, the almost preempt everywhere type of mentality. What happens is all these spin locks turns into mutexes. Interrupt, interrupts get pushed off into threads. So there's really no hard interrupt context. Um, we also add a priority inheritance uh, feature to all the, lock, all the sleeping locks in the kernel. We add priority inheritance. Uh, right now, today, priority inheritance is in the kernel, but it only works for mutexes. So if your system, or if you're using like uh, pthreads, and you have pthread mutex create, and you give the attribute, I can't remember the exact attribute name, but you can say prior inheritance or whatever, uh, that Futex will get priority inheritance. So if one thread, a high priority thread blocks on a lower thread, uh, lower thread uh, p thread mutex, it will uh, boost the priority of that lower thread task holding the mutex and run there. So in user space, this works. But it's not in the kernel, not without the real time patch. Let me talk a little bit about the sleeping spin lock. So what happens is when you enable this, uh, well, let me. State the first thing it says. A pre config preempt is a global lock. What I'm saying is when you disable preemption, you just said, I'm the most important task on the CPU. No one is more important to me. It's like having priority 100, where you know, 99 is the max, 100. Nothing can preempt you. So that's, this is bad when you have a low priority, non important task disabling preemption. It's now the most important task on the system. Well, it thinks it is. So whenever you grab a speed lock, that, or the spin lock, it disables preemption, excuse me, like Robert Loves uh, talked about, or I talked about with Robert Loves' uh, work. And we don't want that. So the way to do that is let spin locks sleep. So we actually convert spin locks into a mutex. So instead of grabbing a spin lock or spinning, we actually, if you block, you actually go to sleep. Now there's something called adaptive uh, spin locks, which uh, is what we really do, which is if you block on a spin lock or a sleeping spin lock, you check to see if the owner is awake. Because most likely, spin locks in the kernel are very short time periods. So instead of scheduling out and then scheduling back in, it, that might be too long. You just actually, oh, the owner's awake. Let's wait till the owner's, while the owner's awake and still has a spin lock, we're just going to spin. If the owner goes to sleep, then we'll go to sleep too. Or if the owner releases the lock, we'll get the lock. But a lot, that speeds up things tremendously. Um, People in uh, what's called Suzy actually came up with that. That was actually a great idea. Um, now we have like two types of uh, interrupt. Uh, oh yeah, must have interrupt threads. Okay, spin lock, th interrupts have uh, or interrupt handlers have a lot of spin locks. So if you turn the spin locks into mutexes and you actually run in a, a hard you know interrupt context, you hit you block on a, a spin lock, you're going to sleep. And I don't know if you guys realize, but sleeping in a hard real time or in a hard interrupt context is not a good idea. So we have to push all the handlers into threads. That's a must. So once interrupts are threads, 
then that actually makes it things, it's not really reasons to disable interrupts. And again, this uses priority inheritance. And it's not just for futexes anymore. I, add, this is, I added this from Barcelona. Preempt lazy, I want to talk about this, another enhancement. Remember how I said the real-time kernel, number one importance is determinism. Number two importance is throughput. Now these two are almost inverse relational to each other. The more deterministic you have, the less throughput you have. How do we handle this? One of, the tri one of the things that we found out with the preemptible kernel, we're preempting all the time. And then we have this timer tick that goes up in the, um, for sked other tasks. Everything's kind of given a certain amount of uh, time to run. So if you have a bunch of tasks, sked other, you know, the, uh, the CFS scheduler is going to say, okay, give this guy some time to run, this guy some time to run, this guy some time to run. What happens now is the tick will go off and says, okay, your time is up, preempt you. So we stop the guy at that time and run the next guy. Now what's the problem with this? The problem is he may have been, been holding a lock. So we just preempted this guy holding a spin, what used to be a spin lock is now a sleeping, it's just mutex. So we schedule this guy out and schedule some other guy. Real-time task wakes up, goes to grab that same lock, now he's going to block on it, has to wake up this guy that just went to sleep, give him the priority inheritance, let him run, release the lock, and come down. Where if we just let the uh, task finish while he had that lock finish and release the lock, we wouldn't have that contention. This constant, um, this, what's it called? The CFS scheduler was causing a lot of contention of spin locks much more than a normal Linux kernel, and it was killing performance. We still had the latency, we still had the small latency, we still had deter determinism, but throughput on everyone seemed to be going down uh, tremendously. So what we do now is with the preempt, um, it's called preempt lazy. So if the tick goes off and says, oh, this guy's holding a lock, it just says, hey, this guy should schedule when he releases the lock. But don't schedule him out now. Uh, only time that's, that's um, conditional. If a real-time task wakes up, and, or anyone that says, I need to schedule now, it will stop him then. He'll run. It's just the tick-based CFS scheduler says, okay, your time has, you know, is up, but you're holding a, a, spi a sleeping spin lock. Continue until you're done. When you release the lock, then go to sleep. So that actually... The throughput went up tremendously once we implemented this. <clears throat> priority inheritance. Okay, priority inversion is bad, but you can't get rid of it. What we get rid of is what, what we don't want and what we can get rid of is unbounded priority inversion. Uh, anytime you have a task running, that uh, when another task wakes up of higher priority and it wants to run, but it has to wait for another task to finish, doing whatever it's doing, whether it's doing the process of interrupt or just holding a lock, that's a priority inversion. Uh, that means that this lower priority task uh, is running while a higher priority task wants to run but can't due to whatever reason. You can't get rid of complete priority inversion, but unbounded priority inversion means that there's a chance that this uh, higher priority task wakes up, blocks on a lower priority task, but this lower priority task may continue forever. You don't, there's no bound to how long that um, task will run, and that makes your system undeterministic. You can't claim to be a deterministic uh, operating system if you allow unbounded priority inversion. That's why the, real, or the mainline kernel right now can't have that one, two, or three millisecond latency or jitter is due to priority inversion. It's complex. A lot of people have criticized priority inversion because it's a complex algorithm, and we've actually tried tried to make multi-owner for rewrite locks, to have priority inversion with rewrite locks, that just made it more, just like exponentially more complex. That's why we, well, another reason why we hate RW locks is because all RW locks now is a single mutex in the real-time kernel, which kills our throughput. Let me explain what unbounded priority inversion is. We have this task, which is a lower priority task. We have A, B, and C, three tasks. A is the highest priority, B is the second priority, C is the third priority. He's, C is running along and gets preempted by A. Well, in the meantime, C grabbed a lock. A runs, highest priority task, hits that same lock, okay, go back and continue. But before C could finish and release the lock, it gets preempted by B, because B is of a higher priority. And B runs, let's say B it will run until A tells it to stop. <laughs> See what happens? There's no bound. Now B will just continually run, and A is blocked forever. Our highest priority task in the system can't go continue. What does priority inversion give us? Or priority inheritance give us? C runs, blocks. As soon as we blocked here, what that means is 
C will now inherit the priority of A. So C is now running at a temporary priority boost. So when B woke up, it won't preempt because now C is of A's priority, which is higher than B's, and B will have to wait. So when it releases the lock, you know, this guy goes up, A continues to run, finish, when A finishes, now B can run. That's priority inheritance, and this is where everything's bounded. You can actually measure this and see how things, uh, what your max latency will be. Now, there's some places in the kernel that we can't have sleeping locks. The scheduler is the main one. Okay, you can't really have a sleeping lock for the scheduler. Um, and there's a few other places. The timing code does this. So we have this thing called raw spin lock. Uh, back a couple years ago at the real time, one of our real time workshops, uh, we tried to brainstorm, you know, how did, what we should call this. And, you know, because we can't, one thing that Linus Torvalds told us is uh, the original way of doing spin locks was we had this magical macro that would magically turn some locks into sleeping locks and some locks would not stay into sleeping locks. And just by looking at the code, you couldn't tell if this spin lock was a sleeping lock or not sleeping lock because we had this magic macro that was determined on the type of that lock. And Lena said, that's not acceptable because it either has to be a, a lock that could always that could sleep when you turn this feature on or it could be a lock that doesn't sleep. Uh, we had this whole thing about what name should we call it. Uh, I liked the name live lock and deadlock uh, or goldly locks. Um, but we came up with raw spin lock. So what we did is we converted everything that's going to always be, because before we we're going to label what the sleeping locks are going to be, but we, that was too many locks. There's only a few locks that doesn't, should never be converted. So we said, let's call those raw spin locks. So if you look in the kernel today, you'll see a bunch of law, raw spin locks that really in the kernel, there's no meaning for having this raw spin lock. Mainline doesn't need it. Again, this is another reason why I'm saying Real-time will be in mainline because we already have code in mainline that's only for the real-time tree. Um, so we are setting this up. So when you see raw spin lock, that's telling you this lock must always uh, spin. It can never be a sleeping lock. So thread interrupts. Now this, uh, okay. Interrupt, when an interrupt handler comes in, so a lot of times you'll have, like, say if your disk drive goes off, it call, <coughs> calls the interrupt handler, and the interrupt handler runs. Well, again, interrupts, a hard interrupt will disable interrupt. Well, when an interrupt is triggered, most likely it will disable interrupts, and then it will run on a not, like, in a, it can't be preempted, a non-preemptible mode, which means that this interrupt handler is the most important task in the system again. And even if you're doing interrupt handling for tasks that you don't care about, it's going to block your real-time tasks. Um, so we don't want that. We want to be able to, you know, push that off and let um, our real-time task, if our real-time task is more important than these interrupts, we want to be able to let our real-time task, user space task, run over an interrupt handler. So another, some of the things that are kind of nice about uh, making interrupts as threads, you could prioritize each interrupt handler. Yeah, sometimes, some hardware uh, supports that. You can actually say this interrupt handler is more important than this interrupt handler. But some are, a lot of architectures don't handle that, give you that, or it only gives you a very limited version. Now you can actually go through every single interrupt handler and prioritize what you want. I always put that, that's, that came from the original pat, back in 2007, because update DB, every time I was working, on my, working at home, I was working until like 3 a.m., and update DB would kick off at 2 a.m., and I'd always know it because my system would just slow down to a halt. And actually, I installed the real-time kernel purposely so I could actually continue working and let update DB not bother me anymore. Today, it really, my machines are fast enough that I don't even notice it anymore. But I kept it in there. Um, here's what interrupt happens. Task goes off, interrupt happens. This device handler handles, goes back to the task. This is the interrupt latency, what I call an interrupt latency. Uh, this is the, the latency, or actually the, um, yeah, I guess latency is a good word. What? You know, the, inter the disturbance of your task is going to be this huge, big, this device handler is really long uh, handler. It, you'll only see that in your tasks. With threads, we still need the hard interrupt handler. Okay, that's still a hardware feature. We can't change the design of hardware, so we have to have software. So we're coming up with high priority, high priority task. Interrupt's going to come up. It's going to go up regardless. And we go, we wake up the device thread and come right back. So this is the, the latency for us. It's really, really tiny. And it's consistent. It's almost um, every time we have an interrupt handler go off, they're all the same uh, length. Then later on, this guy, our high priority task decides to go, OK, I'm done. Go to sleep. Now the device handler could go and work and finish up what it's doing. Uh, there's some non-threaded IRQs. Uh, basically, the timer interrupt, uh, which is mostly in charge of scheduling, 
uh, the real-time tasks that are going on. So we don't want the, you know, the time, if the timer up was a thread and you made it um, low priority, you know, basically how do you stop and schedule? Is there a question? Well, actually, we want to get rid of that. I may talk about that later. They, we want to get rid of task lists and soft hierarchies. Yes. They sometimes soft hierarchies run in interrupt context. Sometimes, most most of the time, but they can be running in a threaded context as well. Actually, it would help more. Yes. In fact, actually, I'm working on, there's NAPI, which means new API. I'm actually working on something called ANAPI, which I'm going to call even newer API, <laughs> <laughs> which actually is, converts everything to threads. Because the whole idea is, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it right now. This is good. What happens with the, the NAPI code, it was basically interrupt will go off, process it, interrupt will go off, process it, interrupt will go off, process it. And actually, it could, the CPU was actually the bottleneck here. What we found out was let the buffer handle it, interrupt goes off, kick off the soft IRQ, let it wait, and then the buffer will handle all these uh, processes. And then when the soft IRQ would wake up, then it would say, okay, now we just do them all at once. Or we almost, and we go into a polling mode. And we're just like, let's keep on just going. In a soft IRQ context, we just go into a polling mode. Now imagine if we made it into a thread where we get our first thing, we just kick off the thread, it goes into a, like a permanent polling mode. Later, Q fills up, start going to polling mode, and as a thread, you're still handling it. The delay actually is, effective to have like the interrupt goes off, post it off, let it go, um, handle the um, into a polling mode because you can't do it in a hard IRQ. Soft IRQ, you could go into a polling mode. But even then, it's the polling mode of that could affect the rest of the system as well. So yes, it might help your network, but it's not going to maybe it's not going to help the tasks that need to start processing these tasks. So now you can actually control, let my task go, you know, let the interrupt happen, but the task that needs to process this start having it work as well. So, yeah, like basically we're adding the latency to the, uh, to the networking stack. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the whole thing is you didn't, the thing was you didn't want to do the polling in the hard interrupt context. Because when you do polling in hard interrupt context, that, that stops all interrupts. So you, you know, on that CPU, or, if, or if, you know, whatever, maybe you just have like uh, one CPU that's uh, committed or had affinity for that IRQ. When that's running, it's going to stop all interrupts. So you've got to actually push off to the soft IRQ, which is kind of an interrupt context, but the hardware doesn't consider it interrupt context. It's only a software interrupt context. That's why it's called soft IRQ. So I'm actually be working. I, right now I'm doing some basic tests to see it. There's some tests that show that this actually improves networking performance. So I'm going to, hopefully something will come out with that. Yes. Was that? Uh, well, the threads will have affinity. The threads have affinity to it. And actually, in our RT task, we actually, when you set the IRQ affinity, it tries to keep the threads with the same affinity. We switch back and forth to that. Um, also, there are some things that if you say, uh, what's it called? No, if you put in um, some, when you declare your interrupt, request your interrupt, you can say this interrupt must always be a real interrupt, and it won't thread it. Uh, that's um, don't do it. Don't think that, oh, this, is, this will help me. It's mostly for like timer interrupts. Uh, by the way, threaded interrupts is today in mainline. You could actually, right now we actually have two ways of doing threaded interrupts. One is per device, where the device could say, I want my task, actually this one we'll be working on, is making the driver itself say, I want my uh, handler to be a thread. So you don't have to create your own, you don't have to do anything about creating work queues or whatever you want. You could just say, hey, Give me a thread dedicated for my interrupt. And how do you do that? Request threaded IRQ instead of doing request IRQ. So that will give you a threaded IRQ. And what's also nice about this, you can actually have other, you can have some, that one interrupt line. If you share an interrupt line, you don't, like some of the devices could actually have different um, priorities. 
for that one same interrupt line. So you can actually have one interrupt line that um, handles three different devices, and each device having a separate priority on how that interrupt line works because they're all threaded. Uh, we also have the big switch, uh, one big switch way, where you could just say, give me all interrupt handlers. You could do this in mainline. Say, give me all interrupts to be a um, threaded interrupt. But if you have three devices that don't have their own interrupt, uh, own like threaded interrupt, didn't say, give me a threaded interrupt. They just said, request higher queue. Uh, those devices will actually run, um, <coughs> those devices will actually share the thread of the other devices that's on it. Yes? Well, yeah. <laughs> but today's systems can handle it. Back then, they really, that was an issue and stuff. So today, threat, and we also, we, we fixed context switching is much, much faster today. Um, the overhead of threads is much lower. There's a whole bunch of things that the kernel has improved. So sometimes looking back at the way you did things is beneficial because the whole, you know, um, paradigm of what you're working in has changed. Where the old, some of the old ideas, now are applicable today. I mean, who, look at your cell phones. How many people would use, like, look back at installing a full kernel with tracing and everything on it on an embedded device? You know, look at how embedded device, device, devices have changed. Um, see, I said request started IRQ. I already talked about this. I said two, five, I have this. I already talked about this. Uh, when you'd say, like, when you flip the big switch, we actually create our own little function that uh, will just is what's called for all the uh, IRQs that didn't say I want a thread. It will be given a threaded function to use. To enable the big switch, you not only have to configure it in your kernel, but you actually have to go into the kernel command line and say, or the, the kernel command line parameter, when you boot up the kernel, you actually have to say thread IRQs um, to have it implemented. So you can actually have it compiled, like on a production kernel if you want, you can actually have threaded IRQs uh, the big switch enabled, but it won't default go that way unless the person put on the command line, hey, I want threaded IRQs. Okay, things are not to do in the kernel. Local IRQ disable. I hate seeing this. Really, you should never have local IRQ disable in any driver. I really get ticked off when I look in the driver code and see local IRQ disable because you shouldn't be doing that. You're saying that my driver is more important than everyone else's driver. That's what you're doing. And it's not. <laughs> well, everyone thinks it is. <laughs> it's that old, like it's like my patch is more important than your patch. Review it now. <laughs> you know, it's the same mentality. Don't do IRQ disable in the mainline core kernel. We use it, but we try to we're trying to get rid of them. We hate local IRQ disable. Sometimes I see local IRQ disable, and I'm looking. At them, I'm like, why? What is it protecting? There's no comment, no nothing. I just see a local IRQ disable here, and a bunch of functions are called, and then local IRQ disable. I'm like, okay, what is it doing? Maybe they just said, oh, I just don't know how, why this broke, but if I do local IRQ disable, it, will, it works. Now, uh, I really believe that that is some of the reasons. <laughs> and the thing is, like I said, that also probably means that there's an SMP bug in there. Yeah, it works because it, you just made it non reentrant for this one CPU, but another CPU could come in and hit that same side. So a lot of times I see local IRQ disable, and yes, a lot of times it's buggy. It means that it's not safe with multiprocessors. So, and like I said, it gives you high lat latency, and it really sucks for real time. Use the spin lock IRQ save. This is the angel of it. We want, we love to see spin lock IRQ save. Custom preempt RT spin lock IRQ save doesn't disable preemption because the reason why you have spin lock IRQ usually is because you have that spin lock will be used or somehow be associated with a uh, interrupt that's using spin locks that's going to nest within this guy, and that's the case that if you don't use spin lock IRQ spin lock IRQ save or spin lock IRQ, if you grab that lock, the interrupt goes off, grabs the same lock, you just deadlocked. But since interrupts are now threads, you don't have that problem anymore. All those deadlocks have just disappeared because you could sleep, the interrupt go up, grab your same lock, but you could sleep too because the interrupt is a thread. So you could sleep and then go back. So all the, in real time, uh, the spin lock IRQ, spin lock IRQ save, it's just a spin lock. There's no difference. The interrupts are not disabled. Nothing else is done differently. But what's nice about mainline doing this is you're actually kind of labeling, giving the name the spin lock, you're labeling what you're trying to protect. So it's actually good to do this. Okay, the, the 
less obnoxious, but still obnoxious, um, caller from instead of local IRQ disable, we have preempt disable, which is the same, has the exact same problems as um, local IRQ save. Although you allow interrupts to come in, you still don't let any tasks continue. So you're like, I just don't want any tasks to happen, so I'm going to preempt disable, do a bunch of stuff, preempt enable. And a lot of times, again, I don't know what you're trying to protect. Why, why do you have this preempt disable? A lot of these things are not commented. So uh, what's worse is like preempt enable no resched when you enable it. Because when you preempt disable, if the interrupt comes in and says, hey, you need a schedule. When you call preempt disable, it will actually call schedule. Uh, but then you have this preempt enable no resched because for some reason you know that you don't need to do that check. Usually this is called within a preempt disable. So if you're doing preempt disable, do something else. Preempt disable, you already know preempt disable is already happening. I don't know why you do it twice anyway. Um, or preempt disable, and then you do preempt disable again, then you do a preempt enable, and you know you're in a preemptible situation. Um, it's sometimes okay to use the no resched uh, because you're not going to schedule anyway because you already have, it's a nested preempt disable. Uh, you could throw this in, but this will warn if you do it. If you don't, if you use this when uh, preempt enable, no resched, and you use that um, outside of a nesting preempt disable, it'll give you a nasty warning. So you actually throw this in there. I don't know why I'm telling you guys this. <laughs> this is only because if you know you're going, basically preempt enable, no resched, because you're calling schedule. So if you do a preempt disable, you do a bunch of work, then you're going to preempt enable, because preempt enable will call schedule uh, right after, if, if an interrupt came in and said you need to schedule out, and you can't because you're preempt disabled. So when you do preempt enabled, it does a check. Oh, can I schedule? Yes. Well, you don't, want, you don't want to do that if you're calling schedule right afterwards anyway. So if you have like preempt enable and schedule, what happens is that you can say, okay, schedule out. So you'll, when the preempt enables call, or preempt enables call, it says, oh, we should schedule out. So it calls schedule, you schedule out. Then when you get scheduled back in, the first thing you do is you call schedule again. So the only time that you should ever use that is if you're calling schedule, right? Preempt disable, preempt enable, schedule. But you shouldn't be using preempt disable in the first place, so forget about the slide. No, it has the same problems as local IRQ disable. Yes. 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 Preempt disable disables the preemption on that CPU only. So same same thing. Uh, per CPU. Now this is the one time where people will use preempt disable. They'll say preempt disable because I or IRQ disable, and they'll do a bunch of stuff with uh, these per CPU variables because hey, if I'm not preempt disabling, I don't want. If I don't preempt disable, I might migrate to another CPU. And now the variables I'm working with is not my CPU variables I started with. So people use like local IRQ save this. But this hurts real time. So what we've been talking what we kind of added, we added some um, uh, functions. And that will be coming. They're not in mainline yet, but they will be coming soon. Uh, one thing you always do is you pin your CPU or, or pin, like if you're using a pin CPU thread, so this task only runs on this CPU, you can always use you know, per CPU variables without worrying it because that task will never migrate. Uh, but we added some stuff. Like I said, git CPU var actually disables preemption, so we don't like that. So we added git CPU light. Um, on non preempt RT, it does the exact same thing as git CPU, nothing different. But when you enable the preempt RT, what it does is disables migration. Now, there's some cases where now you have to wear it out. You can still schedule out. So if you are going to modify some per CPU variables, and you scheduled out, something else might come in and modify those same CPUs, uh, variables. But I'll talk about that later. Um, get local var is the replacement for get CPU var, but does the same thing. It just disables migration. We have a migrate disable handler. That's kind of nice. So say if you have per CPU variables that you have to protect from other, um, if you have some per CPU variables that, if you get migrated out, or if you get, sorry, if you get scheduled out and someone else gets scheduled in and goes to that same code path, it might uh, use those same CPU variables and mess up your whole situation. Where in mainline, preempt disable and preempt enable does all the protection you need. There's no bug with SMP because it's a per CPU variable and you just want to make sure that no one else gets in there. What we've added was this local lock, which also local lock IRQ, local IRQ save, which is basically the same as local IRQ save or local IRQ disable or preempt disable, depending on which version you use. But in mainline, it's just like that. It either does preempts disabled or disabled IRQs. But when you turn real time on, it creates this, it uh, creates a sleeping spin lock for you that's associated with the variable you're do getting or with the name. So you have to, this thing actually pass in a name to it. And you pass a name in it and it'll associate, it'll, it'll create a lock for you. So when it goes into the section, it'll grab that lock and then do your work. And then, but still you could be preempted. 
And if someone else comes along, if another task comes along and goes to that same section, it will have to grab that lock too, but you already have it, so it will stop. So it acts just like mainline doing a preempt disable, but it's using locks and it allows um, re more reactions happening. You're not stopping the entire uh, CPU just to do your work. Well, none of that, what's nice about mainline, it actually helps you label the code for you. So it basically labels the, um, <clears throat> the critical section. So it's more documentation, which is a good for mainline. RW locks, don't use them. I'm not going to go talk about it much. Um, is that death of determinism? Uh, there's problems with, uh, because it has recursive locking. You could, uh, there's two types. There's unfair RW locks and there's fair RW locks. Well, so RW SEMs, I think, are uh, fair, whatever. So if you have a rewriter lock, which means multiple readers, one writer, and say if uh, you have a bunch of readers, let's say it's unfair, which means that first come, first served. Or you know, if you're waiting on it, it's basically it's, uh, everyone tries to grab the lock. Whoever happens to be first to get it gets the lock. Uh, there's no queue. You try again. If you miss it, you try again. Miss it, you try again. Go into a loop, constantly trying. So say if you have a large CPU system, and you have a bunch of readers, and they all read it. A writer comes along and tries to grab a lock, but it can't hold the lock while a reader has it. Well, if one reader lets go of it, well, actually, if one reader grabs a lock, you go to grab, the writer goes to grab the lock. Can't because there is a reader on it. Another reader comes along, it grabs a lock. The first reader lets go, but because the first, second reader came in, the writer still can't have it. You just basically, what's called a live lock of the writer lock. The writer lock, the writer will just sit there trying to go, and it goes on forever. Very undeterministic. Uh, it, may, it could actually halt the system, per se. Uh, then there's the fair system, fair lock, where you have a bunch of writer, reader locks, and what happens is when a writer comes in, any new reader comes in, they'll block. They'll have to, they can't grab, so they block behind the writer. Now the problem with that is a lot of people, or actually a lot of people that wrote code with the reader write locks, intermingle like, oh, it's just a reader lock. It never blocks. So they'll put it before and after another lock. Well, you just created the ABBA deadlock associated with that, because now a reader lock, once a reader lock can block, it's now a true lock, and you can actually have it where you do a reader lock, or whatever, you, have, you grab your lock, do a reader lock and block, where someone else has the reader lock, goes to grab the block that you have, it blocks, the writer never continues, deadlock of the system. No hertz. Um, great for power. I just want to I throw this up just because if you really, if your uh, CPU goes into a real deep sleep, when you enable um, or no hertz, and then you expect quick reaction times. We've had people complain, boy, I got this huge latency. Well, I looked at the, I, like you have like no hertz enabled and you got real deep sleep going on. It takes like two milliseconds to come out of the deep sleep sometimes. Like, you know, some systems it can take a long time to come out of your system. Like I said, real time OS is only as good as the hardware. If your hardware can't react to something because it's going into deep sleep, you know, really the best real time uh, idle is idle equals pole. I mean, you just have to up your AC a bit. Real-time user space, don't use priority 99. People love, like, say, oh, I'm going to throw a 99. Don't do that. There's lots, there's, you know, 98 other priorities to use. Use them. You know, you're going to, I've seen things, systems just crash because of that. Uh, don't implement your own spin locks in user space. Um, you know, if you have a real-time task that depends stuff, try not to use, don't, don't have it depend on, like, I.O. That might take a long time. Like, be smart about it. Um, if you can, you know, use memory uh, messaging, basically. And M lock all or mlock, whatever, get your system so you don't have to worry about page faulting in. And question, actually before questions, I just want to see something. Oh, SMI. You can't see this, let me get up it. C control R. Plus, whoops, ah, I did Darn it. Ah, what's the um, control? Wait, is this plus? Eh, it doesn't want to give me a. There it goes. I was running at the time. I, I just killed it. But if you can see, for, I know you probably can't see this, but I was running cyclic tests during this whole presentation. I had one. This is a laptop on my laptop. I'm running real-time kernel. So, and I ran everything. I ran my Trebuchet program. Everything I had a 231 um, micro max microsecond latency. Uh, I can guarantee you there's SMIs going on on this uh, laptop. Almost every laptop has SMIs because it usually handles thermal. If you go in and turn off your SMIs, uh, you'll most likely fry your laptop, so don't do that. But that was just the idea. This, I am running the real-time kernel on this uh, laptop. So any questions?